so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession based on, based on a lot of factors, some of which we, we've spoken about. Now, the other half of your question, which is, you know, important to listeners is what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. So the Fed story kind of goes like this. The, the Fed, uh, you know, forecasting what the Fed's going to do is the easiest thing I do. It's because it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm smarter than anyone else. The Fed actually tells you. All you have to do is listen and believe them. Now, a lot of people don't listen or they listen like, oh, the Fed will never do that. They, they will. They actually mean it. The conundrum is, OK, they've been raising rates since March 2022. Monetary policy works with a lag. Inflation peaked in July 2022, and it has been coming down ever since. That's, you know, some of the some months were, you know, February was a little hot compared. Uh, sorry, January was hot compared to December. But the trend has been down. So and they're raising rates and inflation is coming down. So that's good. But here's what they don't know. Was inflation coming down because they were raising rates? Or had they already hit the terminal rate and they just didn't know it? Because Wall Street was like, no, you've hit the terminal rate. Stop. Please stop. This is you got this under control. The Fed doesn't believe that. One of the greatest blunders in monetary policy was Paul Volcker in 1980, who had started raising rates in 1979 and inflation was coming down. But then in 1980, we had a very sharp recession that had nothing to do with monetary policy. It wasn't caused by Paul Volcker. Jimmy Carter put a cap on credit card interest and everyone banks stopped issuing credit cards. Well, that'll, that'll sink the economy. Um, and then so Volcker reacted to that by lowering interest rates seven percentage points, not 70 basis points, seven percentage points because we're in a recession, right? That's what Fed, Feds do, the Fed chairs do. But because it was a regulatory blunder, they fixed it and the economy came roaring back. And then inflation really took off worse than when Volcker got in in 79, early 1980. So Volcker had to take rates to 20% to get inflation under control the second time after cutting them in 1980. And that's called the Volcker mistake or the Volcker blunder. And Volcker himself, I spoke to him, he said, um, that, yeah, that was, that was a mistake that I should have stuck. I should have stuck to my program, not worried about the economy and unemployment, but just got inflation under control. But when he threw in the towel prematurely, the inflation went to the moon. This is a central banker's worst nightmare. Um, I talked about how the Fed is blundering because they're raising rates too high, too fast, et cetera. And they are. But the Fed has always said, we don't worry about inflation. We don't like it, but we know how to get rid of it. We just raise rates and maybe they got to raise them longer and further than people expect. And maybe it's painful. There are costs involved, but they can kill inflation just by raising rates. They don't know how to stop deflation. I mean, how do you stop deflation? You can't raise rates. That'll make it worse. You can go to zero, but, but that doesn't, once you're at zero, you're at zero. QE doesn't work, by the way. It's been tried to the tune of like nine trillion dollars, but the evidence, the empirical evidence is that it's just, you know, they, they, they do QE by buying bonds from the banks and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never goes to the economy. What good does that do? And the answer is it doesn't do any good. Jay Powell doesn't want to be that guy. Jay Powell knows that episode as well as I do. Um, and he doesn't want to be the guy who throws in the towel early and then inflation just goes to the moon and then he's got it. Then he has to take interest rates to, you know, 15% or something ridiculous. So Wall Street's saying, you're already there, mission accomplished. Powell's saying, not so fast. They told Volcker that and he cut rates and it was an enormous mistake. So Powell's not going to be that guy. So he's, so what is the terminal rate? Uh, two weeks ago, it was three weeks ago, it was at five and a quarter. Today, I would say five and a half because we had, we had a lot of hot data, you know, unemployment down, uh, job creation up, retail sales up, uh, not to the moon, but these are the opposite of what Powell is looking for. So he's had no confirmation that inflation is coming down on his own. He's had a lot of data that says inflation may be getting ready to take off again. So you got to say the terminal rate went from five and a quarter to five and a half, maybe more. Let's, you know, see what he does in June. 
So that's the, and, and Powell always said, I don't care if there's a recession. I don't care if there's unemployment because the long-term costs of inflation are going to be much greater than those short-term problems. We got to suffer through that to get a bigger problem under control. These are the three danger zones under threat of economic collapse I'm concerned about most. And I'm going to talk about each one now. Danger zone one, America's food supply. According to the CDC's website, a disaster can easily disrupt the food supply at any time. In the event of disaster or emergency, they advise Americans to have at least a three-day supply of food. But have you ever asked yourself, what happens if multiple disasters hit our food supply chain simultaneously? So you can take rates to zero, but you're stuck. Could you have negative interest rates? In theory, yes, in Europe, uh, Switzerland, and, and a few in Japan did. But there's no evidence that it provided any stimulus. I mean, they did it, but it's like an experiment that didn't work. So the problem with deflation is there's nothing a central bank can do. And it does feed on itself and it does get worse. And that is a central banker's worst nightmare. It means that, you know, you, you may not like the price, but you have no choice. You've got to go to work, take the kids to school, deliver goods, use your truck and your job, whatever it is, you have to do it. You have to pay that higher price. But it means that 75 extra dollars at the pump, maybe twice a week, so $150 a week, that's $150 you don't have to spend on something else. Could be concert tickets, a show, a dinner, a new dress, um, a new suit of clothes, um, whatever it might be. You're, you're not going to buy that because you've just spent that much money um, on the gasoline. Well, that means all those other industries suffer. Uh, retailers have lost sales, restaurants have empty tables, uh, concerts have empty seats and so forth across uh, the entire spectrum of, of goods and services. Well, soon enough, that results in layoffs, um, some business failures, um, price cuts, et cetera. And that disinflationary and deflationary trend ends up in a recession. Danger zone number two, America's energy supply. See, even after a trucker strike, the only way the trucks can deliver our food is if they have enough gas to run on. And right now we're in the middle of the worst energy crisis since the 1970s. And not just because of rising prices at the pump. As you may know, in the aftermath of that oil crisis, our government built something called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, SPR. For a worst case scenario, we all hope never comes to pass. Over the last 50 years, it's grown steadily from administration to administration, having recently hit 564 million barrels of oil. And then suddenly everything changed. And while the situation surrounding the way we get our food and energy is bad, it's this next danger zone that keeps me up at night. Danger zone number three, America's medicine supply. Think about it, we're the world's largest economy. That means we have a bullseye on our back. I believe a coming conflict with China, it could be another trade war, internal conflict within China.